Okay, so picture this, you're a scientist, right? And you're carefully digging through these layers of Earth's history, like a detective searching for clues. A geological detective, I like it. Right. And as you're digging, you suddenly unearth something incredible, like a marker of a huge shift, a sign that the planet entered a whole new phase. We're talking about a new epoch in Earth's timeline. Exactly. The Anthropocene, the age of humans, right. But what if, and this is where things get really interesting, what if we've got the main culprit behind this planetary change all wrong? It's so easy to point to human impact and say, well, there it is, case closed. Because it's everywhere we look. Yeah, it's the obvious answer. Exactly. But could there be more to the story? Could there be another piece of this puzzle we're missing? And that's what we're diving into today. Absolutely. This is precisely what Oliver Lopez Corona and Gustavo Magdalena's Gijón explore in their paper. It is not an Anthropocene. It is really the Technocene. Names matter in decision-making under planetary crisis. Okay, so we're tackling a paper that's questioning the very term Anthropocene. And you know it's got to be good when the title practically screams controversy. What I find so compelling about this paper is how it challenges a commonly held assumption. You see, the authors argue that simply calling this new epoch the Anthropocene mm -hmm. might be a little too, well, broad. Too broad? How so? Well, it's like blaming the entire human race for a problem that a specific subset of humans, heavily reliant on technology, actually created. After all, Humans have walked this earth for thousands of years without causing such rapid and widespread environmental change. That's a really good point. It's like saying all humans are responsible for pollution when we know that certain industries and practices are far bigger culprits than others. Exactly. It's about being specific about the problem if we want to find the right solutions. Okay, so where does this term technocene fit into all of this? Ah, the technocene. Think of it as a new lens through which we can view our relationship with the planet. A new lens, huh? I'm intrigued. The authors even introduce a new term, the techno-beyond, to emphasize just how deeply our lives are interwoven with technology. You, me, we're all part of this techno-beyond. Hold on, are they saying we're all basically cyborgs now? <laughs> half human, half smartphone? Not quite cyborgs, though you raise an interesting point. It's more about how technology shapes our behaviors, mm -hmm. our consumption patterns, even our impact on the planet in ways that our ancestors couldn't even have imagined. Okay, so give me an example. How exactly is our technology use so different from, say, our hunter-gatherer ancestors? Consider this a resident of a modern city uses hundreds of thousands of watts more energy than our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Right. That's a difference in energy consumption that's pretty astounding. It really highlights the scale of our technological footprint. You know, now that you mention it, even something as simple as, like, ordering food online involves a whole chain of technology. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's the app on my phone, the electricity powering the servers, the delivery vehicle that brings the food right to my door. And you haven't even mentioned the technology involved in growing the food, processing it, packaging it. Whoa, it's like a whole hidden world. Precisely. Every action we take, even the ones that seem insignificant, are amplified by this complex web of technologies. And we're not just talking about smartphones and the internet here, are we? The paper also looks at those large-scale technologies that are quite literally reshaping the planet. Absolutely. They argue that the technocene marks a turning point where human influence on the environment has become so profound that it rivals natural forces. Wow. Rivals natural forces. That's a bold statement. Give me an example. Take, for instance, hydraulic engineering. We're talking dams, irrigation systems, all these technologies that are literally rerouting rivers and transforming landscapes. Yeah, humans have been doing that for a long time, haven't we? We have. But the paper points out that humans now represent the third stage in the biosphere engineering of rivers. The third stage. Who are the other two? Well, first, you had oxygenic photosynthesis, which completely changed how rivers functioned. Then came the development of vascular plants, which again transformed river systems. And now it's us. Exactly. We're up there with the forces that shaped life as we know it. Wow. I mean, those other two examples, those were pretty big deals for the planet. So to say that we're at that level now, that's, that's something. It really is. And while those technologies have been around for a while, the scale and intensity of our impact have increased dramatically in recent decades. So it's not just about using tools, but the types of tools and the sheer magnitude at which we're wielding them. Right. 
That's what sets the techno scene apart. You've hit the nail on the head. We've gone from diverting small streams to damming mighty rivers, <laughs> from clearing patches of land to transforming entire ecosystems. So it's not about demonizing technology altogether. I mean, let's be real. We're not all going back to living in caves anytime soon. Definitely not. But it's about recognizing that our technologies, as amazing as they can be, also have profound and often unintended consequences. Precisely. The authors aren't advocating for a complete rejection of technology. Instead, it's about approaching technology with a bit more, shall we say, caution. Okay, caution. I like it. So recognizing the technocene isn't about placing blame, but understanding the true forces at play behind our current planetary situation. Exactly. So if we're going to talk about approaching technology with caution, what does that actually look like in practice? Give me some concrete examples. Well, the authors suggest applying what's known as the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle. Now you've got my attention. Tell me more. So the precautionary principle, break that down for me. What is it and how does it play into this whole technocene idea? Well, at its core, the precautionary principle basically says that we should be really cautious when we're dealing with technologies that could have widespread, like irreversible consequences, especially when we don't fully understand the risks involved. So it's kind of like if you're not sure if something's safe to eat, you probably wouldn't just eat a whole plate of it, right? You might want to be a little cautious, see what happens. Precisely. You wouldn't just assume it's fine and hope for the best, especially when the stakes are high. Yeah, and in this case, the stakes are about as high as they get. We're talking about the future of our planet. And speaking of high-stakes technologies, the paper brought up geoengineering. Ah, yes, geoengineering, a prime example of the technocene dilemma playing out in real time. It feels like we're entering the realm of science fiction here. A little bit, right. We're talking about deliberately manipulating Earth's systems on a massive scale to try to counteract climate change. Give me an example. What kind of manipulation are we talking about? I mean, some people have proposed things like launching giant mirrors into space to reflect sunlight or capturing carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. Whoa. OK, I see what you mean about the science fiction vibes. These are huge undertakings with potentially huge consequences that we can't fully predict. It's like we're talking about giving the Earth a giant dose of some experimental medicine without really understanding the long-term side effects. Right. And the Earth's climate is so complex, so interconnected. Who knows what those side effects might be? It's a bit scary when you put it like that. The thing is, we could end up throwing off natural weather patterns, ocean currents, disrupting entire ecosystems, and we might not even realize it until it's too late. So are we just trading one set of problems for another, maybe even a riskier set of problems? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. Like that old saying, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Words to live by for sure. OK, but before we spiral into an existential crisis about geoengineering, right. the paper also talked about how even technologies that seem pretty mundane, pretty harmless, can end up having a huge planetary impact, like CFCs, for example. Oh, CFCs, yeah. Those are a classic example of that. Those were in, like, aerosol sprays and refrigerators, right? Exactly. And when they were first introduced, they seemed pretty harmless. Who knew hairspray could be so destructive? Right. But it turned out that CFCs were quietly wreaking havoc on the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is what protects us from all that harmful radiation from the sun. Exactly. It took years of research and a global effort to phase CFCs out and try to repair the damage. It's a good reminder that even technologies that seem small, insignificant, can have these ripple effects across the entire planet. Absolutely. We tend to get so caught up in the immediate benefits of a new technology that we don't always stop to think about the long-term consequences. And it's not just about chemicals either, right? Right. We were talking about hydraulic engineering, earlier dams, irrigation. Absolutely. Those large-scale technologies that are physically reshaping the planet. And while those technologies have been around for centuries, the paper pointed out that the sheer scale and intensity of our dams and irrigation systems today, it's just unprecedented. It really is. We're talking about altering the course of nature. And I think that's where the technocene concept comes in, right? Exactly. It's not just that we're using tools, it's how we're using them, yeah. the scale at which we're impacting the planet. And recognizing that is crucial. Absolutely. It's about recognizing the magnitude of our impact, both positive and negative, and mm -hmm. taking responsibility for it. Okay, so we've talked about these large-scale examples like geoengineering and hydraulic engineering, but mm -hmm. I want to bring this back down to Earth a bit, so to speak. Okay. What does it actually mean to be a techno 
in today's world? What does that look like in our everyday lives? That's a great question. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed by this whole techno scene thing, to feel like it's this massive force that's completely out of our control. Right. But I think the key takeaway here is not to descend into despair. It's to recognize that we have agency. Agency? What do you mean? I mean, we're not just passive passengers on this technological roller coaster. We have the power to make choices that shape the trajectory of the techno scene. So you're saying we're not just along for the ride, we're actually helping to steer. Precisely. Every time we choose to buy a product, support a company, even just click on a link, we're casting a vote for a particular future. It's about asking ourselves, does this new gadget spark joy? Or am I just caught in this endless cycle of upgrades? Right. Or can I walk or bike instead of driving? Can I support companies that prioritize sustainability and ethical practices? Exactly. These might seem like small, insignificant actions in the grand scheme of things, but they all add up. And I think that's where this techno buyant concept is so powerful. It reminds us that we're not just these isolated individuals making isolated choices. Right. We're all interconnected, both with each other and with the technologies we create. And our choices, however small, have the potential to ripple outward and influence not just our own lives, but the entire technological ecosystem. Absolutely. It's about shifting our mindset from passive consumers to active participants in shaping the future of technology. It's kind of empowering, though, when you think about it. Like, even our individual choices can actually have a ripple effect. Mm, it is. Yeah. But it also makes you realize the weight of responsibility that comes with being a techno buyant. Totally. We're not just picking a product or service. We're literally shaping the fabric of the techno scene. No pressure. Well, and that's where the conversation becomes even more interesting, I think, because it shifts from just trying to avoid the bad consequences mm -hmm. to actually proactively shaping a better future. I like where you're going with this. So instead of just playing defense, we can actually play offense. Exactly. It's about asking ourselves, OK, we have all these powerful tools at our disposal, all this incredible technology. What do we want to do with it? What kind of world do we actually want to create? It's a big question. And honestly, it's easy to get so caught up in the day to day, just trying to keep up with our tech filled lives that we don't often stop to think about the bigger picture. You're right. But that's what's so important about this paper. It pushes us to think beyond convenience and efficiency and ask ourselves what really matters. What do we value? And it's not just about the environment either, right? Right. It's bigger than that. Yeah. The authors argue that thinking in terms of the techno scene encourages us to consider the social implications, the political implications, even the philosophical implications of our technological choices. OK, so break those down for me. What kind of questions should we be asking ourselves? Well, for example, are we creating a world where technology serves humanity? Or are we accidentally creating a world where humans become subservient to technology? Now, those are some deep questions. That's getting into some pretty profound territory. It is. It's about recognizing the power of the tools we're creating. It really makes you wonder, are we the ones in control here? Or is technology in some ways starting to control us? Are we shaping the future or is the future shaping us? Those are questions that have been around for a while, but have taken on a new urgency in the techno scene. Totally. Because these aren't just abstract philosophical debates anymore. They're directly influencing the choices we're making about the planet. Yeah. Exactly. And these are questions, by the way, that don't have simple, easy answers. But they're questions that we have to grapple with, especially as we're navigating this new geological epoch that we've created. It's a lot to think about, but I think that's a good place to wrap things up for today. I agree. This is The Deep Dive, signing off, hopefully leaving you with a whole lot to ponder.